Good evening, everyone. We continue our study in the book of Jeremiah, and we ended in chapter 25, verse 14 yesterday. By way of review, I would like to remind all of us that this is one of two parts in the book of Jeremiah that speaks about 70 years. In this first mention of the 70 years, please bear in mind that it has to do with the land being in desolation and an astonishment. And this is an important aspect that we need to remember. It's about the land in desolation. So we call this a 70 years of desolation. Now, later in the later parts of the book of Jeremiah, there would be another 70 years that we would talk about, and we'll leave it for that, and that would be a different 70 years, uh, something which uh, usually confuses many Bible students. We continue from verse 15 to the end for today. God continues to speak through Jeremiah, for thus says the Lord God of Israel to me. And now we see some very serious words being said. He says, Take this wine cup of fury from my hand and make all the nations to whom I send to you to drink it. And they will drink and stagger and go mad because of the sword that I will send among them. If we take a look at this, the key here is the cup of wine. Now, understand that this is not our usual cup. It could be like a chalice. But the idea here. For this chapter, you would find that things are concerned with wine, with getting drunk, with producing wine, with grapes. Now, all of this has to do with the imagery that God is showing to Jeremiah concerning the punishment that is coming. And by drinking the wine cup tells us that there will be no option for repentance, that whatever may happen, the eventual destruction is going to take place. And the wine cup is taken by all the nations and as they drink, they will drink to become drunk. And when they become drunk, then you would find that they will drink, they will stagger. And the idea of stagger here is to, is to walk unbalanced. then that person will be moving back and forth, trying to balance themselves. And then they are supposed to, well, it says here, go mad. And it is to speak without thinking. So think of it this way, that these are all expressions of being drunk. This is an imagery, obviously. And as the imagery goes, it is because God is causing the sword that is going to be sent. And this sword will be the sword of Nebuchadnezzar. And they will not understand or appreciate the violence that's going to come upon all the nations. And they will be 
running around trying to defend themselves, but it will be futile. And so the picture that God is giving is as if they have drunk too much wine. You see, when you drink a little wine, you are joyful. When you drink too much wine, you become drunk and you cannot think straight. You cannot walk straight. You cannot speak right. And you tend to do things that is literally crazy. And this is the imagery that is being painted to us. In verse 17, it tells us this. And then, after God said this, in this vision, Jeremiah took the cup from the Lord's hand. And then, this is a narrative. And then, Jeremiah made all the nations drink. So you, you can see that this is an imagery. It is not literal. But in that vision, you see Jeremiah doing that. To whom the Lord had sent me. Who are they? They will be Jerusalem, the cities of Judah. It's kings. That would be uh, Jehoiakim, Jehoiakim, and then Zedekiah. And its princes to make them a desolation, an astonishment, a hissing, a mockery, and a curse as this day. As the, this day that is being spoken of. As we read yesterday, you would find that this is a pronouncement of what God will do through his servant Nebuchadnezzar. And not because Nebuchadnezzar is faithful to God, but he is faithful to be used as a weapon, as a sword of God to deal with all these nations once and for all. Now, besides Jerusalem and the cities of Judah, and we are not talking about the northern kingdom, we're talking about the southern kingdom. Because the northern kingdom, uh, Shalmanetzer, has already deposed them. It's gone. Now it's only the southern kingdom. And in the southern kingdom, Nebuchadnezzar is not only treating the kingdom of Judah, he will go as far as Egypt. So Pharaoh, the king of Egypt, his servants, his princes, and all his people, all the mixed multitude, mixed multitude would be all kinds of people that will live in the land of Egypt as well. All the kings of the land of Uz, all the kings in the land of the Philistines. The Philistines that we know when we had started with 1 Samuel, they actually occupied the southwest corner of Judah. And so you find that all these names are familiar names, and they are named as major cities because they are major. Ashkelon, Gaza, Ekron, uh, Ashdod. And these are the main cities of the land of the Philistines, and they too will get destroyed by Nebuchadnezzar. Then we have Edom, Moab, the people of Ammon, and that would be on the eastern shore of the Jordan. And then all the kings of Tyre, the kings of Sidon, and of the coastlands which are across the sea. Now, all of these will be the what we call the northern coastal region, uh, north of Israel, on the coast. Then we have Didan, Temar, Butz, and all who are in the farthest corners. Now, by this, we would be looking at the inhabitants uh, that would be very much the south east of Israel. And then we go down to verse 24, and it says, all the kings of Arabia. Now, this word in verse 24 is uh, Aref.
Erev gives us the idea of a desert dwellers. And so the English is Arabia, but it's about Arabia. And this is the south of the Dead Sea and all the way further south into the peninsula. Now, there are many kings of Arabia and all the kings of the multitude, mixed multitude who dwell in the desert. These would be the Midbar. So Arabia is a desert area. The kings of Zimri, the kings of Elam, the kings of the Medes. This would be uh, Madai. Now, this one here would be in the north. This would be in the north. This is in the southeast. This would be in the northwest. This is in the eastern side. This would be in the southwest. And this is far down south. So all of this is telling us that the power of Nebuchadnezzar is incredible and God is using him to punish the entire land. And so all the kings of the north, far and near, one with another, all the kingdoms of the world. Now, here in verse 26, we're talking about the kingdom of all the lands, not just the world, the lands which are on the face of the soil. So let me give you the Hebrew word. The word here means lands. And the earth here means Adama. Soil. And that's where Adam was made from. Now the final part here in verse 26 gives us this idea also the king of Sheshak. The king of Sheshak shall drink after them. Now, Sheshak is actually Babylon. And this is a prophecy that is speaking that even Babylon will have to drink of the cup of wine, which means that 70 years later, Babylon will suffer the same fate. Verse 27. Therefore you shall say to them, say what? Thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel. So this is about the prophecy that all the nations around Israel should understand that this is the true and living God of Israel. And it says, drink, be drunk, and vomit. Now all of this is a series of actions of drinking wine and drinking intoxicated drink and getting drunk and once you get drunk to the point, you start to vomit. That's the idea that's being painted here. That it is going to be totally drunkenness amidst all the nations. Fall and rise no more because of the sword which I will be sending to you. That is the imagery of the drunkenness. And it shall be if they refuse to take the cup from your hand to drink. Then you shall say to them, Thus says the Lord of hosts, You shall certainly drink. You shall definitely drink. You shall start to drink and drink the entire cup. For behold, I begin to bring calamity on the city which is called by my name, Jerusalem. Should you be utterly unpunished? Should you be utterly unpunished if God is going to destroy Jerusalem, the city called by his name, what more will the rest of the nations around Israel 
be subjected to? Can they be unpunished? And so God says, no, absolutely. You shall not be unpunished. For I will call for a sword on all the inhabitants of the land, says the Lord of hosts. Verse 30. Therefore, again, speaking to Jeremiah, speak as a prophet against them all these words and say to them. So this idea of prophesy is actually to speak like a prophet and say this, Yehovah will roar from on high and utter his voice from his holy habitation. As we read through this, you would be able to understand very clearly. Will roar from on high means the sound of the roaring comes from the skies. His holy habitation, the temple. He will roar mightily against his foe, his people. He will give a shout as those who tread the grapes against all the inhabitants of the earth. Now this word, he will give a shout. It actually says that he will shout out Hedat. So verse 30 says he shouts out the name Hedat. Now this word Hedat, it's a loud shout as a cheer that usually people who are pressing grapes will, will, will motivate each other by calling them to Hadad. And that would be the name. Hadad is to encourage those who step on grapes to keep stepping. And so this is a picture that's given to us that God is going to encourage those who tread grapes against all the inhabitants of the earth. And so this picture that we are given is a picture of people who are stepping on grapes. It's about the production of wine. And they shout out the, the name Hadad. And they shout out to each other to encourage each other to continue treading. So this picture of treading the grapes essentially is the bringing of destruction. And so wine, grapes, treading on grapes, God shouting Hadad is to get them to keep doing it because the destruction is not going to stop. A noise will come to the ends of the earth, for the Lord has a controversy with the nations. Now, verse 31, it talks about a case that God is bringing to the nation. We talk about controversy. A case, a charge. And the charge is this that he will plead his case with all flesh and he will give those who are wicked to the sword. And God is just. And all these, the nations, deserve the sword. And so the bringing of destruction gives us a picture of the sword that God is bringing upon them. In verse 32, God continues to speak to Jeremiah. He says this, Behold, disaster shall go forth from nation to nation. As Babylon comes down to conquer, he will move nation to nation, all the way down to Egypt. And it says that, this disaster, by the way, is the same word, evil, shall go forth nation to nation, and a great whirlwind shall be raised up from the farthest part of the earth. God is going to raise a storm that will come and it will take over the entire land. Verse 33. 
At that day, the slain of the Lord shall be from one end of the earth even to the other of the earth. This would be land. And what happens is the massive destruction will bring about massive killing in the land. They shall not be lamented. You don't mourn them. You don't gather them. You don't bury them. They will rot on the ground. It is a time when Nebuchadnezzar comes about. There is no opportunity for proper burial. From verse 34, the picture that we are getting is to tell people to wail. Now, this word wail is like how. How. It's like the wolf howling, but this is about Losing control, losing your property, losing your loved ones. The shepherds and told them to cry. And so this is to cry for help. So we have an A and a B. Both of this is to howl and to scream out. And then it says here, Roll about in the ashes, you leaders of the flock, for the days of your slaughter and your dispersions are fulfilled. It will happen. You shall fall like a precious vessel. Now, what it's trying to say is, you think that you are important? Well, no longer. When this happens, you can scream and kick and shout. It will happen, as God has said, because his words will be fulfilled. All the leaders of the flock, the kings and all the princes, they will then realize that the prophecy of God will hold true. Verse 35 says, The shepherds will have no way to flee. Now this idea of no way to flee literally says they cannot escape. When God said that he's sending the sword out, there is no escape. They cannot run away. Right? Cannot run away. And so we have here an A and a B. Now the leaders of the flock escape. This is an A. This is a B. We are getting a, a, a series of pairs here of synonyms to emphasize the eventual consequence of the sword that God is sending. A voice of the cry from the shepherds and then a wailing of the leaders of the flock will be heard. This is an A and a B. Understand the cry for help, the howling. Then we are told for the Lord has plundered their pasture. The shepherds, which are the leaders, they will eventually see that everything they had will be gone. They will be taken as spoils by Nebuchadnezzar. Verse 37. And the peaceful dwellings are cut down because of the fierce anger of the Lord. The punishment, Nebuchadnezzar, is to demonstrate the anger of God as a punishment. Then we get some strange words. He has left lair like the young lion, for their land is desolate because of the fierceness of the oppressor and because of his fierce anger. As we come to a close in chapter 25, we are told, Jehovah has left his lair. The idea of lair is a, a place of shelter. Like the young lion who has left for their land, the land of Judah, is desolate 
Desolate means it's a horror. It's a wasteland. It's of no use now. Why? Because of the fierceness of the oppressor. Now, the idea of fierceness, this idea of fierceness really is the burning. Right? The burning. The burning of anger of the oppressor. And this would be the one who is violent. And who might this be? Nebuchadnezzar. At the same time, it is also because of God's fierce anger. Now, this idea is fierce anger is from the face of the anger of his nose. And so understand, anger and nose are both expressions of wrath. And God's face is upon the nation of Judah that they will be utterly destroyed. And so these two expressions is to demonstrate the anger as an A and a B. One, the violence of Nebuchadnezzar. And two, the imagery of the incredible anger of God being displayed through Nebuchadnezzar. And this is the picture we're given in chapter 25 of how angry God is when the time comes. It's still speaking at the time of Jehoiakim, but we are now cognizant that as we read through the history from here on, we find that Israel, and particularly Judah, never did repent all the way through from Jehoiakim to Jehoiakim to Zedekiah, all failed God. And so God says this 70 years of desolation, taking them away from the land so that the land will remain desolate, a ruin, a wasteland, will happen for 70 years. And Daniel particularly in Daniel chapter 9, appears to have mixed up the two seventies that is in the book of Jeremiah. And so we will deal with the second 70 in time to come. But in chapter 25, again, I remind all of us, this is the first of the 70 years, the 70 years of desolation. And with this, we come to the end of our session today.